Hi, everybody. Welcome to week five. Uh, we are officially into the second portion of the course. Um, exam one is behind us. Uh, so really the first four modules that we focused on had to do with defining operations. Um, again, focusing on that value creation process, trying to uh, understand and improve productivity. Um, we also talked about you know, our, our company, our organization's mission and how that corresponds to our strategy for gaining a competitive advantage over our competition or taking a blue ocean approach where we are um, thinking creatively about how to meet um, unmet demand that customers might not even know they have. Um, we also talked about project management, which is really kind of a, a key um, skill for an operations manager, making sure that you are managing all of those critical path activities and keeping them on time and within budget. And last but not least, forecasting. So making sure that we have some idea of um, what to expect in the future because we base a lot of our decisions in terms of uh, scheduling not only personnel, um, but also equipment purchases. All major decisions are going to be dependent in large part on our forecast. So that again is all focused on planning. Now we're gonna move into um, a section, the second half of the semester is really focused on product and process design. So today we'll be talking about product development. Um, next week we'll focus on quality. So we'll cover um, quality as a whole and we'll also focus on statistical process control, which is a quantitative method to help us understand where we should be investigating to improve our quality. Uh, we'll talk about process design, the different types of process approaches you can take, how to look at um, flow of um, all of your activities in a value stream and how to think about how to improve them. We'll look at capacity management and location strategy. So again, all of these are really kind of focused on that product and process design. So today we'll talk about design of goods and services. So to get us started, I wanna just cover a few key terms. Um, and this is a little bit different than um, what's, what's described in the book, but so R&D is considered um, R&D research and development is really that fuzzy front end. It's that innovation space where you're coming up with new products or services. It's very experimental. There's a lot of crazy ideas that are discussed. Um, but again, it's, a, it's really focused on experimentation and innovation. And the way historically it's gone is that once they, um, you know, the, the team kind of comes upon one or two designs that are, you know, really promising, then they would pass it to product development who would be responsible for um, the design for manufacturing and moving that product or service into production, focusing on marketing and sales. Um, and what has happened, and a lot of organizations still approach it in that, in that same way, especially it's dependent on, on their size, but um, a lot of the larger organizations now are doing something called concurrent engineering, where, so historically, if you have the R&D phase and then you pass off your designs to product development, you could find out that later on down the road that there was an issue with the product design and you literally have to go back to the drawing table and try to redesign, <coughs> excuse me, the product um, so that that issue isn't going to present itself during the manufacturing process. You might want to look at different materials. Um, and if you do that, then if you have to stop pretty late in the game and go back and fix things, then you basically are almost starting from scratch again um, and having to go through that product development process. So some of the bigger companies have been using something called concurrent engineering for the past decade or two. And it's really focused on having R&D and product development run simultaneously um, and having them work much more closely together so that as new designs are coming up, the people on the product development side are thinking about, okay, how might we actually manufacture this? And there's a conversation a back and forth in terms of, you know, how would we do this? Could we think about this differently? What materials might we use? And creating those small iterations um, early on in the process tends to help speed up that entire new product development process significantly. Um, so that's what a lot of um, organizations, larger organizations are doing now. Um, but again, it's not unusual to see in some small to mid-sized companies that our R&D and product development are, are kind of separate entities or departments. So we want to make sure that we're, we're always kind of thinking about where we are in the product life cycle. Um, early on in the introduction phase of a new product um, development or design, there's typically very negative cash flow because you're sinking a lot of costs into R&D, you're working with new suppliers to get the right parts, materials. Um, and then during that growth phase is where you start to come positive. And um, in maturity, that's kind of the sweet spot, of course, where um, you're 
<clears throat> your revenue is peaking and uh, so is your profit, but then you always have to prepare then for that product to kind of taper off over time, especially in the tech industry. These cycles are happening pretty fast. Um, so you always want to make sure that you've got a number of different products in the pipeline at different phases. Um, so a lot of um, companies would have a new product roadmap where you would actually see where a number of different products are in, in their phases, whether it's introductory, the growth, maturity, or decline phase, um, which key pieces you're focusing on now, whether it's marketing or sales or um, uh, growing your, your supplier base. Um, so really a lot, of, a lot of companies that do very well are having, have a number of new products going on at the same time. They're mapping and, and comparing and managing all of these different product life cycles, which can be really challenging, but typically they're the companies that do better. So if you look at um, some of the, the, the leading um, companies, irrespective of the industry, it, just, it doesn't just have to be in the tech industry, but if they have at least about 50% of their sales are coming from products developed within the past five years, they tend to be a market leader. Um, so it is really important to constantly have that innovation and bringing new products and services to market. So as an operations manager, one of the, the key, uh, key components or functions of the work that we do is trying to take large complex issues and um, instead of making them so subjective, actually trying to put numbers around them so that we can help make an educated, informed decision about the best approach to take. So even with new product development and design, it could seem like it is so innovative um, that doing something like that might be difficult. Um, actually, there's a, a, a tool called Quality Function Deployment, QFD. Uh, this is the house of quality. And it's a tool that focuses specifically on trying to take what the customer wants, so we call that the voice of customer, the things that customers are asking for. If we think about an iPhone, can it be um, you know, uh, facial recognition? It could be um, the, the quality of the camera. It could be the user interface. It could be battery life. It could be all of these things. So that would be in that light blue section, what the customer wants. So there are a number of technical ways that you can satisfy those customer wants. You can focus on um, integrating new materials, new design components. Um, so that would be a more technical category. And then you would be able to create that relationship in the middle between the two in terms of how strongly correlated are some of those innovations in design, those technical things that we could be doing that are just coming on the market, and how well do they get us what our customer wants? How, how much do they correspond? So we can actually use that and we can give weights to what the customer wants to determine which of those new key features we should actually be pulling into our design. So the first step is identifying the customer wants, which is really important. You could do this through market research. Um, you could do this through you know, having uh, focus groups. There's a lot of different ways you can approach it, but it's fundamentally important to know what that voice of customer is. Um, the second step is identifying how the good or service will satisfy those wants. Um, so then we want to relate the customer wants to the product hows um, and identify the relationships between the firm's hows, develop customer importance ratings, and then we can actually take some of those metrics and evaluate competing products. So let me just show you what this would look like in a completed format. Um, there's a great example in the text, if you have it, where you can actually flip over some uh, transparent pages so you can see how this would actually come together. But here again, we've got um, the, what the customer wants in that light blue. So in this case, um, I think this is a camera example. It's lightweight, they want it to be easy to use, reliable, and right next to it you see those values. That's basically a weighting for how important that is to the customer. So then we look at how the good or service will satisfy the customer wants. So those hows um, are low electricity requirements. You can have aluminum components, autofocus, auto exposure, high number of pixels, ergonomic design. So these are all kind of approaches to new design elements that could come into the next version or innovation of, of this product. So once we have those hows, um, we can relate them to what the customer wants. So in this case, I think the, um, the black dot is kind of a low kind of um, a low correlation. So if we see the black dot between lightweight 
and low electricity requirements. Uh, that's there, there's some relationship there, but it's it's weak. Um, there's a stronger relationship between lightweight and aluminum components. Now we see in this one the blue dot with a red with a red dot in the middle. That means that there's a strong correlation between the two. So if we look at a customer want of high resolution. Um, that is going to directly correspond to the number of pixels, right? So that, that's going to have a very strong correlation there. So then essentially what you can do is if you have number ratings, let's say weak is going to be, um, we're going to give that a value of one, um, the kind of intermediary uh, correlation between the, what the customer wants and the house is going to be, um, I think in this case it's a, maybe a three or a five, and then if there's a very strong correlation, we're going to multiply that by nine. Then what you can do is you can actually go across and you can multiply, you can multiply these through just like what we did when we were evaluating the different um, vendors or suppliers that we could be using when we were outsourcing. It's the same approach to basically having some criteria, assigning it weights, then calculating which of these hows. So, um, as we see in the beige, which one of those halves is actually going to give us the biggest bang for our buck in terms of um, helping us to meet the customer's needs. So in this case, if we look at the importance ratings, it looks like the highest importance rating we see is 32. And that corresponds to the high number of pixels. And we see that that is probably one of the more important innovations we want to include in our design because it hits on three customer wants and it hits on them at least in a in an intermediary or a very strong way. So it hits on easy to use, unreliable, and high resolution, which are all important to our customers at those different weights that we gave those, those customer wants. So that would suggest to our design team that that's absolutely something that we would wanna consider in the next product design. So again, this is called QFD, uh, quality function deployment. You might also hear of it referred to the house of quality and in some cases, it might, um, you know, if you've got a really, a really high-tech product um, that's that's fairly complex, this may not make sense. But a lot of companies have used it, um, Kodak, Xerox, um, a lot of local companies, and you know, they still use it. I think it's a good practice again for us as operations managers to think about the voice of the customer and how we can take that, quantify that, and actually have that inform the new products or services that we're delivering. So once we have, um, we've done our homework and we've kind of figured out what the customer wants, we figure out how we want to innovate and we have a new product uh, design, then we have to think about design for manufacturing. How do we actually take this thing from concept into an actual product? Um, so there's a lot of things that we want to do and approaches that we want to take as we look at it moving into the, the production process um, but the, there's an entire discipline called DFM, which is designed for manufacturing, that focuses on how do we take that, that concept and move it into production, but we also want to focus on doing that in the most cost-effective and efficient way as possible. Um, so what we typically want to see people focus on is how do you reduce the complexity of the product? Um, how can you look at um, kind of the life cycle of the product, so reducing the environmental impact? How do you look at standardization of components, um, which is really easy for assembly and also working with our supplier base to make sure we're getting um, high quality parts at a decent cost. Um, we wanna look at improvement of functional aspects of the product. We wanna think about job design and job safety when we're actually in the, in the manufacturing process. Um, we wanna think about serviceability of the product as well. And some of that back end design for disassembly when and if we are, we are gonna bring that product back after it's been used, can we disassemble it and reuse some of those parts? So, and last but not least, um, robust design. Obviously, we wanna be using methods um, to create products that are going to be durable, um, easy to use, and also taking into all of these accounts, not only um, easy to manufacture at a, low, at a low price point, but also, easy to disassemble um, if, if we should be looking to do that. And if any of you watch Shark Tank, these are some of the questions that will come up when people have a new product in terms of what are the materials you're using, what is your production process, what is the value add, value analysis essentially of, um, of how, you're, how you're creating your product. So this is a really simple example that's in the text, but if you can look at these brackets, 
there's a number of different ways you can make any type of product. So in the first case, you can see there's a number of components and a number of fixtures to keep the bracket together, which has a price point of $3.50. Um, you could maybe look at different methods, um, which would have fewer components and that would bring you down to two dollars but then there's also some different kind of innovative ideas that you could use that could also create a really durable product at a lower price point and that could not only depend on the complexity of the product but also the materials that you're using so again this kind of falls into that design for manufacturing component of new product development so a few of the product documents that um, you should be familiar with that are a part of this phase um, as we're defining the product, um, which is very important for moving into the production process, is an en engineering drawing which shows the dimensions, tolerances, and materials. Um, also shows codes for group technology, so if you're using some standard components, um, you want to get them into part families. Um, typically, this is good from a supplier resource standpoint if you can um, get multiple different parts from the same supplier or if you can use standard parts. Um, that's going to help you bring the price point down. Um, it's also going to be easier typically for manufacturing and disassembly. We have something called the Bill of Materials, which lists all of the components, quantities, and where it's used in, um, in the product. So again, two key product documents here, engineering drawings and Bill of Materials. To move into the manufacturing phase, these are two things that you have to have. <clears throat> So once uh, you're preparing for manufacturing as well, you would want an assembly drawing, and this is going to be really kind of um, a, an exploded view of how the products, different uh, pieces of the product come together. And you could also have an assembly chart, which essentially is another way of viewing how the different component parts come together and make sub-assemblies, which then come together to form the final product. We have a routing sheet, we have work orders, which are really important as production starts. That helps people within the process know how many sub-assemblies to be making so that we can bring the final assembly together and have all of the materials and parts that we need to, to actually assemble the final product. And another key piece, um, a document to be familiar with is engineering change notices. Change notices are very important, especially when you've got more complex complicated builds, so especially things that are taking a lot longer to do. Um, if you find a, a better way to manufacture or design or, or um, create a product, right, if we could think about those iterative um, cycles that happen between R&D and new product development, if they should come back and realize that somewhere in the manufacturing process something's not working well, if there's a better way to do something, if they fundamentally fix the design, then all of those engineering documents have to be updated as well. So in order to do that, you would need an engineering change notice, which would go back and identify exactly which engineering documents needed to be updated or production documents. And it would also keep track of all of those changes so that every possible um, part or sub-assembly that could be impacted by that change would also be changed within, within the product um, family or the system. So I also mentioned design for disassembly. If you get a chance, um, check out, there are some really neat uh, YouTube videos on a robot called Liam, which was an R&D um, uh, project that was started in 2016, and it was it corresponded with the iPhone 6. And Liam is a robot designed, again, by um, the R&D team at Apple. And it actually disassembles all the, phone, the phones that come in. And it can disassemble them into six major sub-assemblies and then can actually take apart and separate all of the different components. Now, the really interesting thing about iPhones in terms of disassembly is that because a lot of the materials are... Um, are at such a high grade and have such tight tolerances and specifications that even though it might not be cost effective to disassemble um, components now for use in new iPhones, um, they're really just playing around with the technology to understand, obviously it's good from a sustainability standpoint, but if you think about it, if they could really kind of bring the, the supply chain full cycle and bring in used iPhones back in and disassemble and reuse some of those parts, um, that can drastically improve 
in change um, Apple supply chain. So they're really kind of just playing around with this now. And even though, again, it might not bring the price point down um, at this point, it's, it's good for sustainability, but you know, they're, they're starting to move in the right direction to think about how they can re, um, not only recycle these components, but potentially reuse them as well. Now, in this um, lecture, we talk a lot about manufacturing, um, which might seem like we have just a complete focus on products, um, but that's really not the case. There is actually a lot of work that's done, um, even though it's not necessarily designed for manufacturing. Um, when we think about the service industry, we do need to be thinking about what type of documentation is important to make sure that the, the service is happening in a consistent and high quality fashion. And there are a few things that are, are kind of obvious. So having explicit job instructions, if we think about um, service jobs where there's a lot of interaction with a customer, whether it's a call center, or whether it's somebody helping you to troubleshoot or somebody that you interface with at a store, um, there's typically scripts that uh, the team members would have for how to, how to manage or how to deal with different situations. Um, if we think about um, the service industry, like somebody working at Panera Bread or McDonald's, um, they're probably using standard work. And standard work can look a lot of different ways. It can look like a flow diagram. It can look like bullets basically telling you what to do. Or it can be a pictorial, basically, sheet that's showing you exactly how to do the job the right way every time. So standard work is fundamentally important to another um, topic that we'll talk about later on in the course, which is lean manufacturing. And Toyota had, over the course of many years, determined that standard work is really the fundamental way to create stability within the system. And you can't make any improvements to the system without having that stability, making sure that everybody's doing the same job consistently. Again, that is so important to making improvements because if everybody, if there's variation in terms of how your workers are doing the job, it's going to be very difficult to try to make improvements um, because there's, there's no standard, no, there's no baseline for which to improve. Um, so a standard is a rule providing clear expectations. Um, again, it, perform, it forms the baseline for all improvement activities. It's specific and scientific, so we wanna make sure that typically there are um, not only the, the steps, but the sequence in which those steps occur and the time at which each of those steps um, should take. So all of that detailed information when it's um, somebody's onboarded into a new job, if they are delivered, if they're given good standard work and if they're coached and if as a part of that onboard, um, onboarding process, that training process, if they have somebody walking them through that standard work, they should be able to to consistently perform that job um, at a very um, at, at a high rate of quality over and over again. And again, that's gonna per, per, um, give you your baseline upon which to improve. So this is a measurement of effectiveness and it should be documented and communicated. And if there is an, a better way to do something, it should be updated and it should be changed, right? So the standard work should really be a living document that is constantly being updated and improved upon. So just to end on an example, um, so again, you know, when we're talking about the service industry, one of the, the documents that we could use or we could think about um, in terms of standard work is a surgical safety checklist. So we see these things, um, a simple checklist, if it is detailed um, and it is, it's crystal clear and everybody is supported to be using that checklist in the same way, and it really is, again, this is, this is a form of standard work, it is going to create a baseline upon which to improve. It's gonna make sure that everybody is doing the same steps prior to a surgery to make sure that the patient is safe. So I would suggest that everybody keep an eye out for um, some examples of standard work in the workplace. If you have any questions about um, any of the content from this, this chapter, please let me know. And there will probably be another extra credit opportunity coming from this lecture, um, but I will be sending the class out an email over the course of the next couple of weeks letting you know exactly what that is.